in spirit and join me in the call to worship. When all seems lost, God is most near to us. When hatred and division separate us, God's love binds us together. When quarrels estrange us from one another, Christ's light shows us the way to reconciliation. When we feel excluded and left out, the Spirit's peace eases our pain. When all hope of fellowship seems lost, God's grace restores our hope. Let us worship God who makes us one. Passion embraces everyone. Gather the outcast and the lost. Heal the wounds of fear and distrust. And make us a community of reconciliation that we may embody your merciful love and rejoice in your astounding grace. In Jesus Christ. Amen. We are used to choosing what our Lenten fast is going to be. No chocolate, no meat, no TV, no caffeine. While giving something up, we are still in control. We choose what we can do without. This Lent has become very different for all of us. We have been forced to give up things we would never have thought of. Going to the gym, going out to a restaurant together with friends, worshiping together in this place. Think for just a moment about what has become your Lenten fast. What have you had to give up? Have you received an unexpected gift? As we journey closer to Holy Week, let us reflect on our Lenten fasts, those we have chosen and those that have been chosen for us. In the book of Isaiah, the Lord says, Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. 
Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and to not hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and God will say, here I am. justice and do what is right for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed confident in our deliverance let us confess our sins before God and one another let us pray merciful God we long to see the Canaanite women a child of God worthy of mercy and compassion but we fear that our deep-seated prejudice might lead us to dismiss her out of hand. As Jesus' disciples did before us, we want to open our hearts, O oh God, to those who are different from ourselves, but we fear to accept too much of ourselves. Let us know the joy of living in peace and harmony, even with those we would rather live without. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Rejoice in the knowledge of God's saving love. Friends, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. The gospel lesson for today is from Matthew chapter 15, verses 10, 11, and then 18 through 28. Listen for God's word. Then Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this is what defiles. For out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. Jesus answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. 
The woman said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My mother can be a real pain. I mean, I love Serafina, but she can be a handful when she gets pushy. She runs a very successful business as a merchant in purple goods. She is well known and respected, and people will wait for months for her custom dyed fabrics. However, when she is on one of her missions to right a wrong or running around recruiting supporters to chastise the city officials for shirking their duty, everyone avoids her. She goes to the city fathers on a regular basis to remind them of their responsibility to clean up the sewers, fix the dangerous potholes in the road, get the litter off the streets, and round up the overabundance of stray dogs. She takes in strays as well, but we already had three of them and one was pregnant. She warned the city that their shoddy attention to detail was bad for business. In a tourist town and major trade city, bad smells and starving dogs tend to drive the tourists away. Serafina isn't afraid of anyone and never hesitates to speak her mind. She's not an angry or unreasonable woman. She is passionate and persistent in her pursuits. The truth is, her arguments are usually sound and her requests fair. More often than not, she doesn't win arguments. She simply wears down her opponents. But you see, Serafina has been on her own since she was 16 and had to learn to stand on her two, own two feet. When I was two and hadn't started to walk yet, mom took me to see a physician who said I had weak muscles. He called my condition hyperkinesia. He told her there was no cure. Serafina wasn't insulted. She just decided to take matters into her own hands. She gave what she called my cranky nerves a daily workout. She exercised my arms and legs for me. She kept up the routine every day. Eventually I could walk. In the beginning I would just lose my balance and fall, but I was a very determined little girl and picked myself up. When I was old enough, I asked Serafina about the jerky movements. She explained it this way. You have cranky nerves that yell at your muscles. Every time they yell, your muscles jump because they are startled. Whenever an unpredictable sudden movement of my leg, my arm, or my face betrayed my cranky nerve condition, Serafina simply refused to notice. I was teased unmercifully by some of the neighborhood kids who pointed at my wide walk and ran away if my arm or leg was suddenly startled. I remember one of them asking me what was wrong with me, and just as I was about to tell her about my cranky nerves, my face suddenly curled up in a grimace. The girl screamed and ran away. Whenever the big kids tried to bully me, my mother seemed to magically appear. She would grab the ringleaders by the arm or the ear, drag them off to their own homes, and hand them off to their parents, telling them, in no uncertain terms, that there better not be a next time. Around the time of my 16th birthday, I began to suffer from headaches so painful that I screamed with the agony of them. They lasted for hours and days. They kept coming back, no matter what the physicians and my mother gave me to take the pain away. When the headaches came, I was beside myself. I couldn't move or think or breathe for the pain. One day, Serafina found me rocking back and forth, hitting my head against a wall. She knelt down and held my face close to hers. With tears in her eyes, she said, I don't know what horrible demon has possessed you, my darling, but he will not take you from me. Hold on, my darling girl, hold on. She left the house. I don't know exactly when it happened, but the pain in my head suddenly disappeared. In my experience, if it subsided for some minutes, I knew it would return, but it simply disappeared this time. I got on my bed and fell into a deep sleep. When my mother came home and found me sleeping, she got on my bed, gathered me close in her arms, and began to cry. In my whole life, I have never seen my mother cry a single tear. I wanted to comfort her, but when I looked at her face, I saw that those were not tears of sadness, but tears of joy. She was smiling through her tears as she told me about her wild adventure chasing a Hebrew holy man through the streets of the city. I had a million questions, but I didn't interrupt. She told me how he ignored her when she called out to him to save me from the terrible demon that was terrorizing my head. When she wouldn't relent, he stopped to speak to her and told her his work was for the sheep of the house of Israel. 
Serafina is nothing if not persistent. As he turned to go, she ran ahead of him and knelt down, stopping him in his tracks. This was Serafina's modus operandi, to dog them until they gave up or gave in. But it seemed to me out of character for Serafina to beg anyone for anything, and particularly on her knees. Lord, help me, she said, and he still refused her, saying it was not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She went on saying, Alyssa, darling, I don't know what happened. His words hurt me, yes, because I knew he was talking about me. He was talking about you and me. He described us like all those stray dogs roaming our streets. But when I answered him, the words I spoke were angry words. Alyssa, I used his words to tell him I would accept any help he might give me. I said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Just then I saw the faintest smile on his face. I think he almost laughed. He told me I was a woman of great faith and said what I asked for would be done. That was it. And he walked away. And here you are, my dearest child, and your pain is gone. When we awoke the next morning, we looked at each other tentatively, searching for signs of the terrible headache's return. I felt well. We dressed and set out to find the holy man whose followers called him Jesus. Serafina insisted that we thank him. I suspected that this would be grand and public show of our appreciation. But when we found Jesus, he was sitting by himself, peacefully looking out at the sea. He appeared to be about the same age as my mother. When he saw Serafina, he stood up, and the smile on his face was one of admiration. He was grinning so broadly I could see laugh lines gathered at the corners of his eyes. He was delighted to see us. My mother placed something in his hands and motioned me forward. As I offered him this gift, he held my hands in his. I looked down and saw for the first time the most stunning of all the purple robes my mother sold. It was a robe made for royal shoulders. Till smiling, he flung the glorious robe over his shoulders with a grand flourish and waved goodbye to us as we headed back to town. As we walked along, I realized, perhaps for the first time, that my mother and I were the same height. I took note, too, that I was walking along beside her, not behind trying to keep up. The fluid movement of my arms and legs was a wonder to me. I lifted my skirts and jumped up a little ways, landing to my ast astonishment solidly on the ground. I could lift my leg high and kick my foot out. I wanted to run, so I did. I ran all the way back to town. It felt wonderful to be out of breath for the first time in my life. Jesus had taken not only the robe, but my cranky nerves as well. To this point in Matthew, Jesus has revealed to those around him some surprising elements about the kingdom of God. Many of them challenged the status quo and upset the religious leaders of the day. We remember back to the Beatitudes and Jesus' interpretation of the law in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus touched the unclean to heal them, making himself unclean. In healing, he forgave sins, healing not only the physical ailments of people, but also their spiritual shortcomings. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. He healed on the Sabbath, breaking traditional Sabbath laws. Jesus' message and actions were so controversial that even his disciples did not usually understand what he was doing or the things that he was teaching. In the first part of this morning's scripture lesson, Jesus is talking with his disciples about what makes one clean or unclean. He says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles. It is not to eat with unwashed hands that defiles. Jesus is teaching that what is in your heart, what comes out of your mouth is more important than following certain ritualistic laws. After this teaching opportunity, Jesus once again goes somewhere he shouldn't go. He enters the district of Tyre and Sidon, which is Canaanite country. And immediately upon arrival, he is approached by someone who is in need. Altogether, this is not an unfamiliar scene. Throughout the Gospels, many people come to Jesus in hopes of healing for themselves or for their loved ones. 
This episode starts out like one of those stories, but with one important detail added. A Canaanite woman from that region. This changes everything. Because of this detail, because of this woman's race, Jesus ignores her. This little detail turns this story into one that we wish we could avoid or reason our way around. Reverend Amy Howe says that this woman had everything going against her when she pushed her way into Jesus' presence. She is a woman, she is a Gentile, and she has no right to engage Jesus, a teacher, a man, in this conversation. Yet this woman comes begging Jesus to save her daughter, and we expect that our kind and loving Jesus is going to say, of course, I will heal your daughter. But as Reverend Howe puts it, here Jesus is caught with his proverbial compassion down. He says to her, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. This has just become one of those things I wish Jesus had never said. Why does Jesus say this? He calls her a dog, and not a cute little puppy kind of way, but in a scavenger, wild animal kind of way. Does he say this out of a cranky, it's been a long day, leave me alone kind of way? Regardless of why he says it, this is not what we have come to expect of Jesus. Jesus' response is troubling, to say the least. Jesus is telling this desperate woman that his mission is for the Jews and the Jews alone. New Testament professor Douglas Hare says that Jesus was convinced that he must not only that he must not be distracted from his primary mission to his people. And as Matthew tells us, Jesus thought, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Luckily, or maybe unluckily, the story doesn't end there. This desperate woman pleading on behalf of her daughter doesn't take Jesus' answer and leave with her head hung low. Jesus doesn't go on ministering only to the Jews, excluding those of Gentile descent. No, this woman challenges Jesus' thinking, and in doing so, becomes the only person in Scripture to argue with Jesus and when the woman answers him yes lord yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table and here jesus himself learns something surprising about god's kingdom maybe there is room for more in her response in her persistence out of her love for her daughter, Jesus' mind is changed. Jesus commends her on her response and heals her daughter. Matthew says, Jesus answers her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Like I said, luckily, the story doesn't end with Jesus' rebuke of this woman. We are lucky because in this woman's changing Jesus' mind about who's included in God's kingdom, we get to be included. Through this woman, Jesus' view of God's kingdom is broadened to include those outside of the Jewish faith. This moment in the scriptures is foundational not only for what it says about Jesus, that he is willing to be changed and to be opened to God's leading, but that it paves the way for the early church to also include the Gentiles through the ministry of Peter and Paul. Now, I also said that maybe unluckily, this story doesn't end there. It would be a lot easier for us had Jesus not changed his mind when confronted by this Canaanite woman. Scholar Don Wilhelm describes it this way. 
Jesus listens to her insightful response and empathizes with her words. He follows her acknowledgement that her vision of God's reign is indeed faithful. She goes on to challenge us. All too often, we too judge others harshly and need to be confronted by those who challenge our perceptions and help us to experience a change of heart, a widening of the reach of our own mercy and compassion. The story of the Canaanite woman and Jesus alerts us to the possibility that if Jesus can experience a wider vision of God's kingdom, so can we. From the beginning of his ministry, Jesus demonstrated the wideness of God's kingdom. He confronted the power structures and those in power who kept people oppressed. He healed the sick by touch, risking his own uncleanliness. He associated with the lowly and the marginalized, and yet Jesus still had room to grow. There were still things that the human side of our fully human, fully divine Savior needed to learn through experience. Jesus' mission was greater than even he initially comprehended. Jesus' mission, the disciples' mission, our mission, is to share the good news of the kingdom of God. God loves us, God forgives us, and God welcomes us all with open arms. It's hard to believe that maybe even Jesus needed someone else to teach him about God's kingdom. Professor Teresa Brown notes that Jesus is God's son, and yet he is raised in a culture that has strict rules about contact with other cultures. If you remember in the scripture that we read today, Jesus has just finished criticizing the Pharisees and the scribes and the disciples. But amazingly, here he demonstrates his own traditional faith roots in this passage. How often can we get caught up in our own traditions of the ways that we have always done things, of who we have always felt okay welcoming into our space, who we've always included as part of our mission? This story illustrates Jesus' own learning about welcoming the stranger. In focusing on Matthew 25, we have been invited to look at the world differently, with an eye for how God sees each one of us. In the wake of this global pandemic, I think we are learning a lot about ourselves and about our neighbors. In our increased time of social and physical isolation, we are learning what it is like for those that experience these things every day. Those who are more vulnerable to this virus may be experiencing for the first time what it is like to be vulnerable. We have always heard Jesus speak about the vulnerable. In his context, it was widows and orphans. But we may have never really felt like that was us. But now we or someone that we know and love is in that vulnerable category. And we may look at those scripture passages differently. And I hope that on the other side of this pandemic, we will look at our neighbors differently. We will look at those around us who continue to be vulnerable differently. Who are those that experience this vulnerability every day of their lives? Who are those that we often refer to as stranger? Who has come looking to us for help, but has been turned away as we help ourselves or those that look like us first? Refugees, immigrants, the mentally ill, racial or sexual minorities, the poor, and the list can go on. If this pandemic has taught us anything, it's that regardless of any of those categories, we are all in this together. God's love is available to all, and it is the church's job to show that love, to open our lives, 
to open our prayer circles, our thinking, our kingdom, to include all of God's children. The kingdom of God is full of surprises, but the fact that we are called to love our neighbors, friends, enemies, and stranger alike should not be one of those surprises. Amen. Let us hear these words from a brief statement of faith. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human, fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and the renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let us join together in prayer. In peace we pray to the Lord. This day we pray to you, O God, for your church in all the world. Loving God, hear our prayer. Make your church into a house of prayer for all the peoples of the earth, that women and men in every place may love your name and joyfully offer their lives in obedient service. Help us who are unable to gather together to continue to live out our calling as your disciples, loving our neighbors and being the church outside these walls. Strengthen the leaders of your church around the world, around our country, and in this, our local church. Help them to welcome the stranger and the outcast and to resist social divisions that honor the rich and forsake the poor. Help us all as we attempt to serve and worship you in ways that we are not used to. Help us to live every moment in worship and praise of you. God, we pray for the world and for its leaders. Loving God, hear our prayer. Uphold the leaders of governments as they seek to combat this pandemic and do what is right for all people. 
Help those who are struggling financially, the millions of people out of work, those who are already living paycheck to paycheck, those for whom the future is uncertain. God, we pray for children. Loving God, hear our prayer. Defend our children from danger, fill their lives with loving care, and help us to rear them in holiness. Be with our families who now help to teach their young ones at home. Be with their teachers as they learn and find new ways to be a teacher in a time of school closures and social isolation. For the sick and those in distress, loving God, hear our prayer. Heal those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, especially those on our hearts and minds this day. We pray for all those who are fighting the COVID-19 virus and enable those who are able to support them in their need. For our healthcare workers, Lord God, hear our prayer. We pray for these dedicated individuals who give of themselves to care for all who are ill. Be with those working long hours to ensure that the sick are cared for. And God, send your presence to comfort their families as they care for others. We offer these prayers through Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit, and now offer our prayer to you wherever we are as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 67 says, Let God grant us grace and bless us. Let God make God's face shine on us, so that the ways of the Lord become known to the earth so that the Lord's salvation becomes known among the nations. Let all the people thank God. The earth has yielded its harvest. God blessed us. Let God continue to bless us. Let us honor God's blessings by offering ourselves as a blessing to others.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. Faithful one, when hunger threatens our world, you bless us with dreams that we can save the, ch the children of our day. Bless this offering that your dreams for a world without want may bless the lives of our children. Accept these gifts as tokens of our dreams and our commitment to make all people one in your holy name. Amen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, living each day in service to your neighbor, loving your enemy, and embodying God's mercy in the name of Jesus Christ. May the blessings of God, source of life, power of life, redeemer of all life, be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>